I'm Lisa and today I'm going to do an ASMR video that Carlos Flores uh, requested and that's me reading a chapter from a kind of like a dark novel thing but it's not really a dark novel it's a textbook about serial killers mass murder so I thought that was pretty awesome because I love that type of stuff um, so yeah, the it's called Extreme Killing, 3rd Edition, Understanding Serial and Mass Murder by Jack, no, I'm sorry, James Allen Fox and Jack Levin. Um, before we get started, I'm wearing a shirt. It's called A Better Way. It's a place that I interned at uh, this past year or two. Um, I don't remember which one, but whatever. It's a shelter for people who've been abused, any uh, sex, gender, in case you're a transgender or whatever. Um, they accept you, you can stay there for like 45 days, then you have to find a new place. Uh, it's pretty awesome. I like what they do there, and it's really, um, I enjoyed working there. Um, so yeah. Oh, and I did the peace walk thing, uh, and that's how I got the shirt. So let's start the book. America's fascination with multiple murder. And before we get started, I'm just going to go ahead and say there are words that, oh goodness, I got red when I pinched my neck. Don't look at that awkwardly. Um, <laughs> there are words that sometimes I just stumble over. I don't know why, but sometimes I do. Uh, it's not because I don't know how to say them, it's just because for some reason my tongue gets choked up or something. I don't know. And then there are some words in here that I have no idea how to pronounce. So I'm sorry if uh, you have a name like this or you know the name and I pronounce it wrong or whatever, any type of word that I pronounce wrong. I'm sorry if I offend you. That is obviously not what I'm trying to do. Um, okay, so I hope you enjoy. Okay, so America's fascination with multiple murder. The break of dawn on November 16th, 1957, heralded the start of deer hunting season in rural Washera County, Wisconsin. The men of Plainfield went off with their hunting rivals, er, rifles and knives, but without any clue of what Edward Gein would do that day. Gein was known to the 647 residents of Plainfield as a quiet man who kept to himself and his aging, dilapidated farmhouse. But when the men of the village returned from hunting that evening, they learned the awful truth about their 51-year-old neighbor and the atrocities that he had ritualized within the walls of his farmhouse. The first in a series of discoveries that would disrupt the usually tranquil town occurred when Frank Warden arrived at his hardware store after hunting all day. Frank's mother, Bernice Warden, who had been minding the store, was missing. So was Frank's truck. But there was a pool of blood on the floor, and a trail of blood leading toward the place where the truck had been garaged. The investigation of Bernice's disappearance and possible homicide led police to the farm of Ed Gein. Because the farm had no electricity, the investigators conducted a slow and ominous search with flashlights, methodically scanning the barn for clues. The sheriff's light suddenly exposed a hanging figure, apparently Mrs. Warden, as Captain Shue Forster later described in court. Mrs. Warden had been completely dressed out like a deer, with her head cut off at the shoulders. Gein had slit the skin on the back of her ankles and inserted a wooden rod three and a half feet long and about four inches in diameter and sharpened to a point at both ends through the cut tendons on the back of her ankles. Both hands were tied to her side with binder twine. The center of the rod was attached to a pulley on a block and tackle. The body was pulled up so that the feet were near the ceiling. We noticed that there were just a few drops of watery blood beneath the body on the dirt floor. And not finding the head or intestines, we thought possibly the body had been butchered at another location. The brutal murder and dismemberment of Bernice Warden was not the only gruesome act of reclusive man whom no one really knew. 
in the months that followed, more of Gein's Macrobay practices were unveiled. Not only was he suspected in several other deaths, but Gein also admitted to having stolen corpses and body parts from a number of graves. Gein used these limbs and organs to fashion ornaments such as belts of nipples and a hanging human head, as well as decorations for his house including chairs upholstered in human skin and bedposts crowned with skulls. Bedposts crowned with skulls? I mean, kind of sounds cool, not gonna lie, but also creepy at the same time. Um, a shoebox containing nine vulvas was but one piece of Gein's grim collection of female organs. On moonlit evenings, he would prance around his farm wearing a real female mask, a vest of skin complete with female breasts, and women's panties filled with vaginas in an attempt to recreate the form and presence of his dead mother. Okay, I'm just going to take a moment to reread that because to me that was kind of weird. On moonlit evenings, he would prance around his farm wearing a real female mask, so he took someone's face and wore it. Uh, a vest of skin complete with female breasts? He must have liked boobs. Actually, no. That's a lie. Uh, we learned about it in class why he did this. Uh, I think he was really attached to his mother from what I remembered, so he wanted to recreate her kind of like Frankenstein. And women's panties filled with vaginas. Yep. Interesting. The news of Gein's secret passion devastated Plainfield. The townspeople were shocked to learn of the terrible fate of Mrs. Warden and to hear of the discovered remains belonging to the 51-year-old barkeeper Mary Hogan, who had disappeared years earlier after being shot by Gein. They were outraged by the sacrilege of their ancestors' graves. They were literally sickened, remembering the gifts of venison that Gein had presented to them. I think they were just saying that Gein gave them human parts to eat. I also believe, uh, if I remember correctly, that he, uh, the Silence of the Lambs character, he was one of the people that the guy was based off of. It was three serial killers all together. So, interesting. Um... The next section is the Gein Legacy. Any small town is shocked by a murder in its midst, but the horror of Gein's ritual surpassed anything that the people of Plainfield had ever encountered or even imagined. Outside Wisconsin, however, a few people had heard of Edward Gein. As bizarre and offensive as his crimes were, Gein never really made headlines in other parts of the country. What happens in Plainfield is not nearly as important, at least to the national media, as what occurs in a large city like Chicago or Washington, D.C. Very few eyebrows are raised at the mention of the name Ed Gein. Hardly. A household name or a box office attraction, he might have been immortalized like Charles Manson in the film Helter Skelter had he killed in Los Angeles. Had he lived in a metropolis like New York City, director Spike Lee might have featured Gein in a retrospective docudrama as he did serial killer David Berkowitz in the film Summer of Sam. Um, a killer from Plainfield, Wisconsin, which rings very much like Anywhere USA, however, probably will never be regarded as important enough to warrant a major movie release called Autumn of Ed. Although the name of Edward Gein is unknown to most moviegoers, he was discovered by Hollywood. His legendary place in the annals of crime has inspired a number of fictional films, both popular and obscure, as well as a low-budget portrayal of the Gein story, simply titled Ed Gein. The promoters of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre claimed that it was based on fact, although a crime of the description cannot be found in reality. See, it's not real. One thing is for sure, the film contains numerous elements of reminiscent of Gein's patiently deviant behavior. 
For instance, the farmhouse of the chainsaw family of killers like Gein's house is littered with spare body parts and bones. Also similar to Gein, the family has an armchair with real arms. Ooh. I mean, I wouldn't mind. Well, I mean, I would mind. <laughs> That'd be weird. Kind of cool texture, but weird. So, uh, yeah. Don't hang around creepy people. A little-known film imported from Canada more closely parallels the Gein theme. In Deranged, a killer known as the Butcher of Woodside slaughters and stuffs his victims. At one point, he parades in the skin of a woman he has just killed, similar to Gein's Moonlight Escapades. A poster ad for the film depicts a woman hanging from her ankles just as the body of Bernice Warden was discovered. Probably because of Anthony Hopkins' memorable portrayal of Hannibal Lecter in 1991's The Silence of the Lambs, some may forget the presence of a second despicable character in the film known as Buffalo Bill. Just as Edward Gein collected women's skin in order to create his mother, so the serial killer Buffalo Bill trapped and murdered his female victims for the same purpose, to harvest enough human skin to complete his girl suit. So I was right. It is connected to Silence of the Lambs. Perhaps the most noteworthy cinema... Hope you enjoyed that little piece of someone singing. Perhaps the most noteworthy cinematic production inspired by the Gein case is the classic thriller Psycho, the original version of which was directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Operating out of a warped sense of reverence, Norman Bates, played by Anthony Hopkins in the original and by Vince Vaughn in the 1998 remake, stuffed and preserved his deceased mother just as Gein had tried using female body parts to symbolize and resurrect his mother. Both conserved with their dead mothers and both struggled with strict moral constraints that had been enforced by their dominating and sickly mothers. Finally, Norman Bates was implicated in the deaths of two other young women, just as the excavation of undersized bones near Gaines Farm suggested his role in the disappearance of two teenage girls. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah, if you don't watch Bates Motel, you should. It's pretty good. Multiple murder in popular culture is the next section. Sorry, there aren't any pictures so far in this book. Hero worship has always been an integral part of popular culture. Over the decades, we have celebrated those members of society who have reached the pinnacle of success in their fields by honoring them in movies, in documentaries, in magazine profiles, and even on trading cards. More recently, we have extended our celebration to what some consider our new anti-heroes. Those who have distinguished themselves in the worst possible ways by reaching the pinnacle of success as murderers. In 1991, a California trading card company published its first series of mass and serial killer cards, spotlighting such brutal criminals as Edward Gein, Jeffrey Dahmer, Theodore Bundy, and Charles Manson, selling for $10 per pack without bubblegum. They sell with bubblegum? They were no joke. Several other card makers soon followed suit, hoping to cash in on the celebrity of multiple murderers. Even comic books have been used as vehicles for celebrating the exploits of vicious killers like Jeffrey Dahmer rather than traditional superheroes. One comic book, The Unauthorized Biography of a Serial Killer, goes as far as to portray in drawings Dahmer sodomizing one of his victims. By, ta- by taking on a starring role once held by the likes of Batman and Superman, the killer is unnecessarily glorified. As in Marshall McLuhan's famous adage, the, uh, or adage, uh, the medium is the message. The victim's memory is trivialized, trivialized by placing them in a comic book format. In a more respectable context, the coveted cover of People magazine has become a spotlight for infamous criminals. It was bad enough that Milwaukee's confessed cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer was on the cover of People, an honor usually reserved for Hollywood stars and Washington politicians. 
but the popular celebrity magazine also chose Dahmer as one of its 100 most intriguing people of the 20th century. Okay, before I go on, I mean, you can't really be mad at People magazine for doing that. For naming him one of the 100 most intriguing, because what he did is kind of intriguing. Like, eating them, telling his mom uh, when she said, I don't like your friends, then eat the vegetables, meaning the meat was his friends that they were eating. Uh, it's intriguing. It's also intriguing that they wanted to make wanted to make his house a vegetarian restaurant or vegan restaurant. That was kind of stupid, but that's my opinion. Okay, so moving on. Sorry about that. During the 1970s, only one killer was featured on People's Magazine. By the 1990s, in contrast, the incredibly popular celebrity magazine printed more than two dozen different cover stories about vicious criminals, including Dahmer, David Koresh, Lori Dan, and Theodore Kaknevsky. Kaknevsky. I don't really know how to say his name, so I'm really sorry. The public's taste and tolerance for front cover attention afforded multiple murder reached a limit when Rolling Stone magazine gave star treatment to one of the men suspected of setting off bombs at the 2013 Boston Marathon that had killed three spectators and seriously injured hundreds of others. The August 2013 issue featured 20-year-old suspected terrorist Dzarkar Tsarnev or something like that, sorry, on the front cover in the photograph that had been touched up considerably. With his youthful face and wavy hair, Sarnev's image was reminiscent of rocking of rock stars that over the years have made it big when greasing the cover of Rolling Stone. Whether it was the recency of the bombing, the apparent anti-American sentiment behind the attack, or the photo editing toward, the, toward glamour that struck a raw nerve, the magazine came under intense criticism, criticism for its approach. Um, so I'll show you the picture, because they did have a picture of him on there. I actually did a paper over this for my uh, prejudice and discrimination class. Um, I think it was about, it was TMT, Terrorism Management Theory, I think it was. It's when uh, people don't like when something happens that makes them feel vulnerable. So, uh, sorry, that's a horrible definition because I can't remember what it really is about, but I'm pretty sure I'm right on when I say that. The other picture I will get to when I continue reading. Um, do you guys think that they should have serial killers on People magazine or on magazines? I think it's interesting that it struck a nerve when the bomber guy was um, got so much criticism for being on the cover, but not when the other serial killers got on the covers of different magazines. Numerous newsstands and stores refused to sell the controversial issue. Yet, despite a grassroots campaign to mount a boycott, the magazine flew off the shelves wherever available, giving Rolling Stone double its usual street sales for the issue. Television has also helped to turn criminals, real ones like Florida's Eileen Warnos, and fictional ones like Showtime's Dexter Morgan, into celebrities. In fact, some observers like Carrie. Some observers have characterized serial killing as a chiefly media event that allows people to obtain close knowledge of the essential characteristics of serial killing and the propensities peculiar to specific offenders. This is a particularly salient byproduct of media-saturated nature of serial killing, given that it is, dis dis given that it is statistically one of the least common types of crime. Media at the, their worst have catered to public hunger for gripping topics, financially exploiting the gruesome events, and turning horrific into an institution of celebrity culture. Um, I'm gonna... Oh, no, that didn't really say anything. Never mind about that. Um, 
The prevalence of attention to rare but horrifying events such as serial killing is not limited to television media. These stories saturate detective and true crime books and can be seen often in film and police dramas along with collector cards and comic books. Docudramas on television or in theaters are often biographies of vicious criminals, many of whom are played by leading actors and actresses, such as Mark Harmon as Theodore Bundy, Brian De- Dennehy as John Wayne Gacy, Jeremy Davies as Charles Manson, Michael Badalucco as David Berkowitz, and Jean Smart as Eileen Warnos. Actress Charlize Theron also played Warnos in the 2003 movie titled Monster. Uh, winning an Academy Award for their performance and in the process of winning Warnos some posthumous me- measure of sympathy. Having glamorous stars cast in the roles of vicious killers unfortunately infuses these killers with glamour and humanity. Besides the undeserving focus on the criminal as the star of the show in these programs, television doc- docudramas are sanitized by virtue of the restrictions that are placed on the network television. Ironically, though, theatrical films such as The Silence of the Lambs, The Red Dragon, How Long Came a Spider, Copycat, Natural Born Killers, The Cell, and The Horseman are able to depict all the horrible details of purely fictional crimes without fear of censorship. A rare true crime film that does not glorify serial murder can be found in Henry, A Portrait of a Serial Killer. A low-budget motion picture based on the serial murderer Henry Lee Lucas and his partner Otis Toole. Among others of their dastardly misdeeds, Toole and Lucas are strongly suspected of abducting and decapitating six-year-old Adam Walsh, the son of John Walsh, of the long-standing Fox TV program, America's Most Wanted. That's sad. Wow. Um... That is, it's really sad. Um, here are the, here, well, here's that actress lady. I don't know if you, you can't really see her. Sorry about that, but I tried. Um, in Henry, the two killers are shown for what they really are, or really were, cruel and inhumane men without any redeeming social value. They weren't portraying as smart, friendly handsome or charming and they weren't played by actors most people would recognize as stars most important the film refused to soft pedal the monstrous acts of the killing team showing their unmitigated cruelty without compromise um the next one is the selling of multiple murder uh there's a picture on this page if you're afraid of clowns i'm warning you don't look when i show this um, it's a photo of an exhibit of John Wayne Gacy's clown paintings as displayed May 2011 in the Arts Factory in Las Vegas. Um, um, yeah, sorry, that's about as good as it's going to get. They have different names on there. I mean, John Wayne Gacy was up top, but then... He makes some really creaky clowns. But on the bottom it says Emmett Kelly and someone else. I don't know if like other people or something. I don't know. Uh, anyways. The selling of multiple murder. The glorification of multiple killers has created a market for almost any anything that they s- say or do. For example, the artwork of John Wayne Gacy became much in demand, but only after he was convicted of killing 33 young men and boys in Des Plaines, Illinois, and especially after his execution by the state of Illinois. His very ordinary paintings of clowns have been displayed in art galleries and have become collector's items. His paintings had special significance because he had been known to dress as a clown to entertain children at neighborhood parties, birthday parties. While he was still alive, Gacy made $100,000 on sales of his paintings through a broker. That's a lot of money for stupid clown paintings. Like, his were creepy. Similarly, the paintings of deceased mass murderer Richard Speck, who slaughtered eight nurses in Chicago and then died in an Illinois penitentiary, now sell it for $2,000. 
although this kind of price tag may seem relatively slight for original art, his paintings would hardly be worth the canvas they're painted on, were it not for his bizarre notoriety. Along the same lines, a Denver art studio pr produces and sells serial killer action figures. Similarly, similarly, collectors of what has been termed murderabilia can purchase a wide variety of clothing items emblazoned with their favorite serial killers or can bid on such items as a lock of Charles Manson's hair or a pair of his sandals at an internet auction site. Some individuals are so fascinated with serial murderers that they will purchase any item associated even remotely with the killer's hideous crimes. Bricks taken from Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment building were considered by some as prized souvenirs. Other serial murder fans were willing to bid for the refrigerator in which Dahmer had held his victim, victim's body parts. Several websites auction off souvenirs associated with Dennis Rader, who was captured in 2005 for the BTK killing spree, including dirt taken from his home and sold by the ounce. How desperate and silly are these people? Why would you pay for dirt? Get dirt outside of your yard and just pretend it's from his area. It's the same as anyone's. Wor worms poop in there and crawl in there and bugs and ugh. Save yourself some money. After it was discovered that Gary Ridgeway was the so-called Green River Killer who had murdered at least 48 prostitutes in the Seattle area, eBay customers were eager to purchase Green River related merchandise over the internet. Until it was yanked from the website, customers could bid on a blood red t shirt bearing the image of Gary Ridgway and the words, I was good at choking. Or they could purchase a business card from the Green River Task Force and a used mug taken from the truck factory where Ridgway was, had worked for 30 years. The business card was sold for $29, but the old mug br brought only $4.25. Why would a business card cost $25? Oh, $29, not $25. Before his arrest in 1995, 47-year-old serial killer Keith Jesperson was dubbed the Happy Face Killer because of the doodle he scribbled on his anonymous confession. The long-haul trucker, who took the lives of at least eight women in five states, sells his artwork online. At two websites, his colored pencil drawings of various animals in the wild were displayed with their price tags of $25 each. A signed, <laughs> a signed photograph of the killer came free of charge with every purchase. He saw himself short compared to the other people. A song written... By multiple murder, Charles Manson became a cult classic when recorded by heavy metal rock group Guns N' Roses on their 1993 album The Spaghetti, Ac the Spaghetti Incident. To publicize the release, lead singer Axl Rose wore a Charles Manson t-shirt on the album cover. Patty Tate, sister of the Hollywood actress Sharon Tate, murdered in 1969 by Manson followers, said in response that the record company is putting Manson up in a pedestal for young people who don't know who he is to worship like an idol. Patty Tate's judgment was confirmed when an iconoclastic young rocker adopted the stage name Marilyn Manson. Huh. That, mm, I should have known. Should have known. Uh, huh. Well, makes sense with, like, how he he, I mean, I don't know, I've never watched his YouTube videos, but, um, what I hear is him sacrificing animals, uh, during his concerts. Um, Charles Manson himself still maintains his own music career, even from his prison cell. Tapes of his music have been smuggled out from the penitentiary and then distributed on, dis on CDs. No small wonder that Manson, even in the 70s, have 
after four decades behind bars, still boasted that he is the most famous person who ever lived. Although his sense of importance is absolutely inflated, at least in terms of name recognition, Manson's claim may not be that much of an exaggeration. Americans have become fascinated with, many, with the many talents displayed by vicious killers. Apparently, Sacramento serial killer Dorothea Piente was renowned for her culinary skills, so much so that in 2004, author Shane Bugby published a collection of her favorite recipes in a book titled Cooking with a Serial Killer. That's interesting. Uh, drifter Danny Rowling convicted in Gainesville student slangs performed his own musical compositions. He sang love songs to his sweetheart, both in court and with a guitar accompaniment on the national television program A Current Affair. He and his then fiance Sandra London, published a book containing his artwork and poetry, which many fans purchased at leading bookstores around the country. Decades ago, the New York State Legislature passed the Son of Sam law, prohibiting murderers like David Berkowitz from profiting off their crimes. In 1991, however, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that this law was unconstitutional on the First Amendment grounds. This decision by the court hasn't prevented creative attempts to ensure that killers do not reap financial reward even while being punished for their crimes. For example, in 2010, Senator John Cornyn of Texas filed a bill to prevent the proceeds from the sale of memorabilia. <laughs> murderabilia to be transmitted to convicted criminals through the U.S. mail. It is disgraceful even enough when private citizens buy and sell killer art and artifacts, but even the federal government has gotten into the sordid business. Compelled by the court order, the General Services Administration, GSA, in May 2011 launched an online auction of personal items that belonged to a Unabomber, Theodore Kaczynski, the reclusive misfit who killed three victims and injured 23 others during the 18-year-long year campaign of mayhem. Included on the auction block were his driver's license, birth certificate, academic transcripts, and personal checks, which have been recovered from Kaczynski's secluded Montana cabin, the same structure that drew large crowds when it was on display at the muse museum in Washington, D.C., Weird, it's called Museum. I've never heard of that before. Huh. <laughs> the prize centerpiece to the GSA sell-off, of course, is the original 35,000-word manifesto that Kaczynski negotiated by threat of violence to have published in the Washington Post. Both the handwritten and typed versions were available for the highest bidder. The auction was mandated as part of a $15 million restitution order for Kaczynski's victims and their families. Although the objective was certainly laudable, hawking Macrobay property to those fringe collectors who wish to own a piece of infamy is a dubious way to raise money. Rarely do serial killers have financial means to contribute as restitution to the innocent people they harmed. For this reason, it is the government's place to establish and fund victim compensation programs. It is unfortunate, however, that the celebrity of someone as undeserving as the Kaczynski would be advanced in the process. Thank you for uh, watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and have a great day.